Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Aside from Bridgegate, the news that has captivated us most in recent weeks and months has not been about the start of a new city administration, but about the implementation of the Federal Affordable Care Act. Who's actually benefiting from it? Who stands to gain nothing at all? Who's losing ground? Who's actually going to be paying more for health insurance? And has it turned out to be the bugaboo that Republicans and a fair number of Americans feared it would be? Few people know more about the pros and cons of affordable care than Nancy Metcalf, senior project editor of Consumer Reports magazine, and she'll share her assessment of it with us today. Welcome. You know, when one thinks of Consumer Reports, one thinks about ratings for washing machines, toasters, car seats, maybe cars, not about information about health insurance. When did you start focusing on the Affordable Care Act? Why? And what kind of information do you give to your readers? Well, first of all, we've been writing about health insurance for decades. Okay. In one of our very first issues back in the 1930s, we called for health reform. Uh, so it's not in the a 19 news 30. Wow, okay. Uh, it is not a new subject okay. for us. Okay. Uh, we actually publish rankings of health insurance plans in, in cooperation with the, the National Co Committee on Quality Assurance, which is the major health plan accreditation organization in the United States. So we're, we're in that space. Okay. Uh, and we have been actively looking at the healthcare system and following the progress of health reform for the last, uh, since before the 2008 election. Even. Okay. What, what are the basic, the biggest misconceptions about affordable care? Uh, the Affordable Care Act, I think the biggest mi misconception is that it's somehow going to bankrupt America. Um, it's not going to bankrupt America. The law uh, contained within it provisions to pay for itself, um, almost all of which are now in force. Uh, if you are a middle class person and haven't noticed it, there's a reason for that, which is that none of the taxes or fees so, uh, that, that were put in place to pay for this law were placed on middle income Americans. They were placed on the health insurance industry itself, which stands to earn billions of dollars of extra revenue as a result of the law, and on very wealthy Americans who can afford it. Okay. So in general, what does, and I'm going to look at several categories, in, in general, what does it offer to low-income people? It offers uh, what the, the, the law says, affordable care. Um, if you look at who's been uninsured in this country um, over the years, it's the, the poorer you get, the more likely you are to be uninsured because insurance is really expensive. We've had a program, Medicaid, for certain categories of low-income people, uh, parents of very young children, uh, pregnant women, and children themselves through the extended Medicaid program for kids called CHIP. But most adults can't get Medicaid, even if they literally have no income at all, uh, if they don't fall in one of these categories. The new law expands Medicaid to cover every household with an income of under 133% of the poverty level. That's about $15,000 for an individual. Um, and states are, have the option, thanks to a Supreme Court ruling, of taking this expansion or not. New York State has taken it and is in the process of signing up a lot of new people into Medicaid. I, I'm, I've been trying to nail down exact statistics. It's a little tough. I think it's close to 100,000 possibly now. Um, I, uh, that's a very tough population to get to because um, a lot of low-income people uh, have assumed they're not eligible for Medicaid because they haven't been. And it's, it's, it's a project to get the word out that they are now eligible and that there are no asset tests. It's only based on income. So if you have a car, if you have a condo or a co-op, if you have a little retirement account or some money in the bank, it doesn't matter. It's only your income. And that's a big departure from how Medicaid has worked before. Now, if you're somebody who lives in Mississippi, uh, which I assume did not do the Medicaid expansion, are you out of luck? You are out of luck. There's something called a coverage gap 
Right now, 25 states plus the District of Columbia have expanded Medicaid. The entire Northeast, I think with the possible exception of Maine, have expanded. Mm -hmm. uh, the West Coast, oh, the blue states, okay. basically. If you look at the red and blue state map, you, you, you can pretty much tell which states have expanded Medicaid. Uh, the, the South, uh, the sort of uh, in, in inland West have not. And in those states, people with incomes below 100% of the poverty line simply have no source of affordable coverage still. It's, it's really a tragedy. So you, so even, I mean, you can't go on to, I mean, they're the state. So the states that didn't expand Medicaid, do they have um, uh, state, red, do they have, what is it? The exchanges, red, marketplaces. Do they have exchanges at all? Yes, yes, and that's been another point of confusion because the Medicaid expansion was a, a a big news item for right. a long time and a lot of people who lived in those states took it to mean that there was not going to be any Obamacare in their right. states. That's right. not true. Every state has a health insurance marketplace where people over the poverty le level right. can purchase health insurance and if you are in a household with an income of less than 400 percent of the poverty level and go on to, one, uh, on to your state marketplace you can get a subsidy to help you pay for your health insurance. Um, so even in a state that has, whose leaders, a state like Texas or Florida, where the elected leadership has been an implacable opponent right, right. of health insurance, they have these marketplaces. Um, in, a, in 36 states, the federal government is running the marketplaces because the state governments declined to set them up. Mm -hmm. But states were also given the option of running their own marketplaces. Right. New York has run its own marketplace, and it's one of the more successful ones. Which so is can a poor person who lives in Mississippi go onto the federal marketplace, yes. and he could purchase insurance, but the problem is that he won't probably won't be able to afford it, or not. What if 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 it's a household with an income of above a hundred percent of poverty? Okay, that household will get a subsidy. Okay, um, a federal subsidy. A federal subsidy, and it's. It, it's the, the poorer you are, the bigger the subsidy. So a household that was right at the poverty level would probably get a subsidy that brought the price of that insurance down to you know, $30, $40 a month. Okay. Very, very inexpensive. Okay. And they will also be able to buy plans that have very low out-of-pocket costs. Okay, okay. Um, what does it do? My sense is that affordable care doesn't do much for the middle class. I mean, middle class, you know, well, you have the people who are covered, get insurance through there. Uh, employer at fairly low cost, but if you not, but if 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 those costs are high, or if you don't get it through your employer, uh, it doesn't do much for you. Uh, how it ha how it affects middle income people is very complicated. First of all, it's important to understand that only about seven percent of the population are potential customers of the marketplaces. That's how many people don't have access to either public some kind of public insurance, Medicaid, Medicare or employer-based insurance. So we're talking already about a small number. Okay. We know because the, the, we just got some new enrollment figures this week that over three quarters of the people who are buying insurance in the marketplace have qualified for subsidies. So it is helping them. Uh, uh, and the, the way those subsidies work is that the amount you have to pay for a premium is capped at a certain percentage of your income. So if the premium is Seven hundred dollars a month, and and you're uh, and you're deemed based on your income only to be able to afford two hundred dollars a month. You get a five hundred dollar subsidy, mm -hmm. and you can. It's basically like a, a it's basically like a gift certificate that you could apply to any plan on that marketplace. So the cost so that's that's a help. Um, the employer-based insurance really has not been terribly affected by this, and that was by design. It's one of the parts of our system that actually was working pretty well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and for young people, obviously, uh, they can stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26, and presumably, I guess the the cost of medical insurance I mean, are they, are they generally going to be lower through these exchanges than they would have been otherwise? Well, certainly they are in New York. Okay. But uh, New York was a, kind of an oddball state because, because of some regulatory decisions that were made decades ago, uh, which are very complicated. Um, individual health insurance in New York had become completely unaffordable. It was, it was $50,000, $55,000 a year. $55,000? A year for a family in New York City. No one could afford it. 
um, because uh, and with the arrival of the New York State of Health, the New York State Health Insurance Marketplace, premiums went down drastically. A, a, an individual policy that might have cost fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars a month before January first now costs more like three or four hundred dollars mm -hmm. a month. So it's been a huge affordability savings for New York. Okay, okay. Um, according to a recent New York Times article, 2.2 million of the 4 million Americans who are eligible to, to buy insurance through the exchanges have done so. That's right. That was the report that just came out. Is that an encouraging number, an okay number? Well, it's, so it's encouraging considering where we started, right. uh, which was that the federal exchange, the federal marketplace that was servicing 36 states just simply did not work for the first month of its existence which was October. It worked kind of at the beginning of November, but finally by the end of November it got working. And um, if you look at the graph of enrollment, it goes psh, like this mm -hmm. because people could actually buy insurance. I've actually sat with several people as they bought insurance on healthcare.gov and it works now. Okay, <laughs> okay. Now there's, is it a March 1st or March 31st deadline? The March 31st deadline is the end of open enrollment for 2014. Okay, so what does that mean? That means if you don't buy insurance by March 31st and you're in the individual market, you cannot buy it again until the end of the year and your coverage won't start until 2015. You can't buy anywhere, not on exchange? Nowhere. Not, not off the exchange, not on the exchange, anywhere. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, are most of the insurance companies on the exchanges? Do they have some presence on the exchanges? You know, that's really a state-by-state state, uh, thing. You take a big insurance company like Aetna, um, which has a huge presence in the employer market. I think they're in 13 or 14 states mm -hmm. uh, and not in the rest of them. And I think it's really been a business decision for each carrier, yeah. depending on what their market share was, what they think they can sell. Um, uh, in New York, there's a robust selection of plans. Okay, we're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Nancy Metcalf of Consumer Reports Magazine. <music> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Nancy Metcalf, Senior Project Editor at Consumer Reports Magazine. Um, so what kind of service or information does Consumer Reports offer to your readers on affordable care? We developed an online interactive tool uh, to, to help people orient themselves as to how this law affects them. Uh, people have the sense that it's this big complicated thing, which it kind of is, um, and uh, it's, if they don't know, they need a road map. Of, of where to even get in. And so what this tool is, and you can find it on our website, or, or it has its own website, healthlawhelper.org. Answer a couple of very non-invasive questions, and it's anonymous. And you will be told where you stand. If you say, I have Medicare, you'll be told, you don't have to do anything because Medicare is health insurance and you have met the requirement to have health insurance. If you tell us what your household income is and how many people are in your household, we will tell you whether you qualify, poss likely qualify for Medicaid, whether your kids qualify for CHIP, or whether you qualify, or, or whether you should go to the exchange or marketplace and buy a plan, and if you do, whether you qualify for financial help. If you tell us that you have insurance through your employer, we will tell you how you determine whether that coverage is adequate. Um, and if it's not, then you can go to the exchange and buy a plan as well. Okay, and you sort of direct them to where and they then, And then we point them to whichever situation. place they need to go, right. Um, have difficulty, I would imagine that difficulties in navigating the system may have given rise to a whole new specialty of medical insurance advisors. Has, has, is that true? Uh, uh, well, the, the law actually built a system of those into itself. Uh, there's been, there are, there, there have been many, many, many millions of dollars uh, of grants given out to community organizations, uh, religious groups, um, all kinds of qualified organizations. Mm -hmm. <coughs> to fund uh, people called in-person assisters or navigators 
who can answer, who have been trained to answer questions about the law right. as well as literally sit at a desk with people and help them enroll in whatever. What, what seem to be the main areas of confusion? You know, the, uh, uh, well, initially it was just getting through the website. Right. Uh, a couple of areas of confusion. One is, how much is your income? Uh, people think they know, but they really don't. Uh, the subsidies are based on something called modified adjusted gross income. So it's not your total salary or your total earnings if you're a freelancer. It's the number at the very bottom of the tax t return called adjusted gross income with a, a few things added back which don't really affect most people. Um, and especially for people who are self-employed, oftentimes that number, their, their adjusted gross income, is quite a bit lower than their total income. So I think a lot of people have been surprised by the size of the subsidy that they qualify for, for compared to their total income. So that's one thing. Another is your household size. I often say that doing, applying for health insurance nowadays is more like doing your income tax. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be asked a single question about your health status because insurance companies are no longer allowed to consider it. It's not relevant to them. What, what they really need to know is what's your income and how many people in your, are in your household because that determines the size of your subsidy. So when you apply, we, what we've advised people is before you apply, drag out your last year's tax return, your bank account statement, uh, your investment accounts, a pay stub if you have it, a ledger if you're self-employed, because those are the numbers you're going to need to supply okay. to get health insurance. Now, consum does Consumer Reports, are you still ranking specific insurance companies or particular plans? We work, we work with NCQA, which is a national nonprofit accreditation organization, to publish their rankings of health insurance plans. Um, we don't have rankings for all of the plans that are being sold in the marketplace because some of them are companies that are, have been newly created to participate in this space. And so there's nothing to rate, rank them right. on yet. Um, but these rankings are at our website, consumerreports.org. They are free of charge. Uh, we normally put them behind our paywall, but because we knew so many people will be shopping for insurance this year, they're in front of the paywall right now. And, uh, you know, if, you are d if you're trying to decide what plan to buy, um, which is the other thing that people are really needing to spend a lot of time on, is picking out a plan once you find out that you qualify. Right, right. Um, because there are a lot of decisions to be. I know. I mean, I was uh, talking to a friend who was, she and her husband recently retired, and they're trying, they're, well, they were trying to figure out Medicare, get Medi Medigap plans. And they got so confused right. that they hired somebody to research the plans for them and, pay, and paid them, I think, $400 for that. And so it, it can be very, I, if it's confusing for Medicare, I'm sure it's pretty confusing for... Yeah, although less Medicare. confusing than it used to be. Okay. Because uh, this law, uh, these, these are some things that are not well appreciated about the law that are really important for consumers. One of them is uh, that I've heard people say, how can I be sure it covers everything? Here's how you could be sure, because the law says it has to cover mm -hmm. everything. They listed in the law as a list of 10 essential health benefits that every plan must cover. And they're what you would hope they would be. Doctors, hospitals, medicine, tests, ambulances, emergency rooms, rehab, everything. Right. Uh, it, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know if a lot of people realize that <clears throat> up until the end of 2013, in New York State, you could buy health insurance plans that did not cover anything except hospital care. If you went to a doctor, if you needed a $30,000 a month outpatient chemotherapy for your cancer, it wasn't covered. Okay. Those, those plans are illegal now. Okay. And people, people bought that stuff all the time, not realizing how dangerous it was and how unprotected right. they were. The other thing is, that's a huge protection for consumers is ever the, the it is no longer legal for plans to put any dollar limit on the total amount of care that they will cover in a year if you have some spectacularly catastrophic disease that costs a million dollars they have to pay they have it. to pay the whole million okay, okay. so and, and so that's another huge protection. Now, dental care is not covered it's covered for kids okay it's a it's a it's an essential health benefit for children but not for adults in new york state however you can buy a dental plan on the marketplace okay that's optional in new york state adults can that's optional and they decided to do it 
Has Affordable Care lowered the cost of pres prescription drugs or done anything to reduce the, there's often a big discrepancy, well, there's certainly a big discrepancy in the cost of drugs between, say, the United States and Canada and some other countries, and sometimes between different insurance plans. Has it done anything to address no, that? No, no, because um, the, the, the companies selling on these marketplaces are private insurance companies. They work the way they always have with some new restrictions. They have to spend at least 80 cents out of every dollar that they collect in premiums on health care. Didn't used to have to do that. They have to provide all these benefits. Didn't used to have to do that. They can't put any limits. Didn't used to have to do that. They can't turn you down if you're sick. Didn't have to do that. that you used to have to do that. So lots of protections. But still in all, they are private insurance companies, and they make their own deals with doctors, hospitals, imaging centers, and pharmaceutical companies. Um, we recently, last week, uh, got the latest data on health care spending in the United States. The trend for drug prices is the, the increase is very, was very low. Uh, it, I don't think it had anything to do with the Affordable Care Act. It had to do with the fact that uh, a lot of very expensive drugs went off patent and are now available in generics okay. for a fraction of the price. And there haven't been a lot of new blockbuster patented drugs. Okay. Um, I've noticed that pharmacies in New York City are now offering vaccination to get vaccination for the, well, you for the flu, but you can also get vaccination for shingles and other things. Uh, and there's also been in the city, there seems to be, a spurt of walk-in medical clinics. Does this have, do you think this had anything to do with affordable care? Well, I think the vaccination part did because um, another, another uh, new thing as a result of this law is that every single insurance plan, and this is, uh, this is plans, not only plans sold on the marketplaces, but plans sold privately and employer plans, if you are covered through a job, it's, it applies as well, have to cover a whole list of official list of preventive services. They have to cover mammograms for women of a certain age. Uh, they have to cover colonoscopies when you turn 50, cholesterol screening, and if you have a chronic disease, there's an even bigger list. And they have to cover, cover immunizations. So, so that means that if you need a shingles shot, and there's an age, I forget what it is, I think 60, where you're supposed to get a shingles vaccine, and they're quite expensive, your health plan has to give it to you for free. Okay. No deductibles, no co-pays, no nothing. Okay. Why has affordable care gotten such bad a bad rap? Uh, because it Republicans was, gone wild. <laughs> the, the history the history of health reform in the United States is long and anguished. Uh, people have been trying to do it for almost a hundred years. Um, uh, there have been many serious runs at it, and uh, we finally saw it happen in 2010 by uh, by a slender thread. I don't know if people, I, I remember it, but probably most people don't. It barely made it through Congress without a single Republican vote, a very partisan issue, very emotional in the United States. Um, and I, I think what we see is that there's still a big component of uh, the political world that has, does not like it, doesn't accept it, wants it to fail and is actively trying to do everything it can to make sure it fails. It seems to have a lot of people who need it. Well, that's true. That's true. It. I mean, one one thing that's really sad is that you look at when you look at a state like New York or Connecticut or California, where the state the state political leadership embraced health reform, really worked to make it happen, has done a lot of made a lot of efforts to get the word out. You see robust enrollments, state-run exchanges that worked quite well from day one. When all the when the federal exchange was still struggling, big enrollment numbers. A place like Texas or California or, or, or Florida, where the governors refused to expand Medicaid, refused to open an exchange, and in fact have actively tried to foil the implementation of the law. They've they for example I mentioned the the navigators and in person assisters. Um, they've actually passed laws to put onerous extra requirements on these people. They have to post bonds and take extra classes right, and stuff. Right. And so there just aren't an, as many. And, and the whole political discourse in, in places like that is this place, this is a terrible thing. It's going to ruin you. And so you're, you're right. Country. A lot right. of people who would right. qualify for right. it think it's terrible and want nothing to do with it. Right. And you see very low enrollment numbers. So your advice to people who have not signed up and, and you know, need health care or ought to have health care is to do what? 
Sign up, first of okay. all. <laughs> and, and, and perhaps start out with your website. Start out with it. our website, healthlawhelper.org. Do not, I mean, it, it's true that if, you're, if your income is low and you don't get health insurance, you only have to pay $95 if you're an individual for, as a fine for not having health insurance. But um, I don't think that people appreciate how expensive health care is. You know, one bout of appendicitis, $50,000. Yeah, yeah. You know, it can ruin you. And, you know, if so, no one, in my opinion, should be a day without health insurance. I heard from a reader the other day whose uh, husband lost his job and they just didn't get around to re getting new health insurance by January 1st. <laughs> Their insurance expired at midnight on December 31st. She woke up in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning on January 1st, and felt a lump in her breast. And now has no insurance and they're right. saying, we want to charge you, th your next test is $3,000. Yeah. So, so that's so the message what is sign up. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. Don't let any time go. <laughs> okay. We're out of time. I want to thank Nancy Metcalf of Consumer Reports Magazine for joining us today. And if you'd like more information, go to Nancy Metcalf's blog. Healthlawhelper.org. Okay. Healthlawhelper.org. And it's in Spanish as well. How do you pronounce that? Uh, Asegura tu salud. Okay, <laughs> dot org. And you will find the answers to most of your questions, and we'll have that posted on, on uh, our website as well. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.